an ordinary house. Often, the orbs will divide like cells splitting in two. A third appears, and the three orbs form into triangular craft, just like many other sightings in other parts of the world. There is no denying these reports, too many people have seen them. For some strange reason, around half of all UFO sightings occur around bodies of water. And many believe the sheer number of sightings at Lake Erie could mean that this is a meeting place, or even base, for extraterrestrials. Often, the pulsating orbs of light will submerge. What are they? Nobody knows. Everybody has heard of Roswell, an infamous crash of a UFO. But five years before, there was something much more profound. It has become known as the Battle of Los Angeles, because it happened during the Second World War. Los Angeles was, like many other cities on the shores of the USA, in blackout. It was just a few weeks after the infamous attack on Pearl Harbor. We armed our merchants, and for the first time they steamed into the combat zones to deliver Lend-Lease. While this was going on in the Atlantic, the Japs, by so-called agreement with the puppet government of defeated France, moved in on Indochina. There were now only two threats to their plan for conquest of Greater East Asia. First was their northern neighbor, Russia, the only military power within striking distance of Japan. The Nazis were taking care of Russia. The second threat to Japanese conquest was us. Japanese southward expansion was too dangerous to attempt with our bases still standing in the Philippines and our supply lines open to Wake, to Midway and to Hawaii. We were in their way. We had to be removed, but in the Japanese way. Off to Washington went Special Ambassador Curacao on what the Japs said was a mission of peace. But carefully synchronized with his departure from Tokyo was the departure of a Jap task force under sealed orders, not on a mission of peace. On November 14th, Mr. Curacao arrived in San Francisco smiling his toothy smile as he sang the old song of Japanese friendship. The Japanese were a peace-loving people. Their whole policy was devoted to the establishment of permanent peace in Asia. Our aid to China was delaying the establishment of that peace. Our refusal to sell them oil and scrap was interfering with the establishment of that peace. Our objections to their taking over the East Indies, 
Greater East Asia was an interruption in the establishment of that peace. All they wanted was peace. On November 17th, Mr. Kuroso and Japanese Ambassador Namura were received by the President in the presence of the Secretary of State, Cordell Hull. It very quickly became clear that the Japanese had brought no new proposals and that the Japanese intended to continue their campaign to conquer China and all East Asia. However, on November 26th, our Secretary of State presented the Japanese with the basis for peaceful agreement between the two nations. The proposal was forwarded to Tokyo. The Japs had to stall for time, but only a short time. A task force was nearing its goal. Sunday, December 7th, 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. The Japanese emissaries are expected at the State Department to keep a one o'clock appointment they had requested in order to present their answers to our proposals. 1.5 p.m. The Japanese planes are approaching Hawaii. 1.10 p.m. The Japanese emissaries telephone to postpone their appointment until 1.45. 1.20 p.m. The Japanese envoys, smiling and correct, arrive at the State Department. 2.20 p.m. been sowing death and destruction for an hour on American outposts in the Pacific. December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. The United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. The United States was at peace with that nation and at the solicitation of Japan was still in conversation with its government and its emperor looking toward the maintenance of peace in the Pacific. We were not sufficiently on the alert in Hawaii the Japanese won a series of spectacular victories in the Pacific. Under General Douglas MacArthur, American and Filipino forces fought a fabulous delaying action in the Philippines. Manila was bombed, although it was declared an open city. Because of vast distances, it was impossible to send supplies or reinforcements, and Bataan fell. 
only when Americans and Filipinos had eaten their mules. General MacArthur established his headquarters in Australia, and as Commander-in-Chief of the United Nations forces in that area, prepared for the offensive that would develop inevitably. For despite setbacks, we had established a supply chain 6,000 miles across the Pacific that stretched to New Zealand. Like the other democracies, we were not prepared for total war. Fortunately, under the Lend-Lease Act of March 1941, we had set out to become the arsenal of the free and fighting nations. We were determined to supply them with our war goods, whether they could afford to pay or not. We were buying time. Time to convert the industries of peace into war. Time to make ships, merchant ships and war ships. Time to make planes and more planes, bombers and fighters, faster, more powerful than any the world had ever seen. Time to make guns, and more guns, shells, and more shells, tanks, and more tanks. Time to gather the huge strength which was ours, to pour the great riches of American earth into the cauldron of war. America was at war. It had been at war, although few Americans realized it, for more than 10 years. Ever since September 18, 1931, when Japan clawed Manchuria out of the body of China. While Hitler was still brawling in the streets of Munich, Japan had already begun weaving the pattern of aggression. And the warriors of Japan, still breathing the spirit of the samurai in an era of machines, adopted Western methods of warfare as they had adopted Western clothes and architecture and music. And the Japanese warriors dreamt of the conquest of Asia, and then of the world. And their emperor invoked the blessings of the divine upon this dream. And the United States was in panic. They were expecting attacks on their Pacific seaboard, and all eyes were on the skies. One night, a huge aircraft appeared over Santa Monica and Culver City. Everybody assumed it was a Japanese attack craft, unlike anything they'd seen before. Thousands of air raid wardens ran around trying desperately to secure the citizens. Anti-aircraft batteries fired thousands of rounds at the object, and the powerful searchlights trained thousands of eyewitnesses onto the vessel. Los Angeles and Southern California went into lockdown. Gun batteries reported direct hits, and yet the craft hung in the sky, virtually motionless. Witnesses reported American fighter planes were sent up, and yet the military deny any planes were dispatched. Waves of them according to eyewitness accounts, went up against the massive ship. Eventually, they appeared to be called off, and ground forces let loose with everything they had for over half an hour. Six people died as a result of the flak from ground forces defending them. Eventually, the craft moved down to Long Beach and disappeared. However, this was wartime, and the media was under a lot of control. The only mention of the sighting, seen by hundreds of thousands of people, was in the LA Times, which ran a small sidebar article. To this day, the event is unexplained.
Another mass sighting occurred in Vancouver, Canada, during a game of baseball. It was the start of the sixth inning when suddenly hundreds of people started tweeting images of glowing lights that suddenly appeared. A shining blue orb hovering over a field fence. Nobody discovered what the object was, but thousands of people saw a UFO. Over in Zimbabwe in 1994, there was something more than just a mass sighting. This was a mass close encounter. It occurred in a small town called Rua, and the witnesses were the children of the Aerial School. They all came from different ethnic backgrounds and ranged from 5 to 12 years of age. These children not only saw an alien ship, they saw a fleet of them. Then one of the ships landed and the alien visitors communicated with the children. They were warned, humanity needs to take better care of the planet. As news of the close encounter emerged, experts descended on the school from all over the world. Psychologists, researchers and doctors. The children were asked to draw what they had seen and it was a common story. Grey aliens with long necks and large eyes emerging from huge alien aircraft. One Harvard professor of psychology and Pulitzer Prize winner said later that the event seems to have been what they said it was, alien visitation. The children were in fact terrified. One adult witness noted, this thing, whatever it was, was beautiful. It had a circular shaped bright light as the leader and behind it were tails of light in beautiful colours, green, orange and yellow. It moved slowly and looked as if it were just above the house. The amazing thing is that it moved absolutely silently. The alien apparently wore a silver suit and had long hair and a cape. It walked down from the craft and towards the children, then it paused and disappeared. At that moment, another alien appeared behind the craft, and then it too disappeared. Then the craft lifted off. The communication had come to the children without words. But as one child put it, those thoughts came from the man, the man's eyes. Most of the children in this rural community had never seen a television and certainly not seen any of the classical western notions of aliens. This was fresh. Preconceived notions of aliens and UFOs were quickly ruled out. Many of the children admitted to never having heard of UFOs before the event. Following extensive interviews, psychologist Dr. Mack concluded that the children had not experienced mass delusion. What they had witnessed that day was real. Dr. Mack was eventually censored by Harvard University. An investigation into his work ensued. He was cleared and allowed to proceed with his work. What were they afraid of? A few years later, Mac was hit by a drunken driver in London and killed. In 
China, a spate of mass UFO sightings occurred and even disrupted airline travel. Dozens of witnesses saw glowing lantern objects that formed into diamond shapes and hovered for an hour. Another glowing V-shaped object was spotted by hundreds of witnesses in the same area. As in other areas of the world, the glowing orbs change colour. 